my name is Jalen Avila of the Core Ultrasound Podcast. In the last episode, I gave you the first half of my most updated lecture on arrest and peri-arrest ultrasound. That's patients that are super sick um, and are headed towards needing CPR or they're actively getting CPR right now. I talked to you about how I use it to identify ver- reversible causes as well as how I use it to help guide my procedures. And we also talked about how you can identify arrhythmias with that ultrasound. And I kind of left off with this topic, which is the fact that there are some studies that show that ultrasound is associated with prolonged pulse checks. I see this data and it's there and it's true and it's real, but here's my problem. And and this is said with utmost respect to the authors that these are codes that weren't run well. I mean, if you look at, you know, at least the pulse checks, right? I'm sure the codes were done expertly well, but if you even look at the non-ultrasound pulse check, they're 13 and 14 seconds. Both of those are almost, you know, 50% more than what they should be. There's no place in the universe, uh, the known universe, where 10 seconds doesn't equal 10 seconds. And that's also true in resuscitations. 10 seconds is 10 seconds. The ultrasound machine in of itself doesn't do anything that you as the provider don't make it do. So the ultrasound itself is not prolonging anything. You are prolonging the full check. This should be that providers, when they don't keep track of time, prolong pulse checks. That's really what this is saying. And remember, 10 seconds is 10 seconds. The way I do this is I basically have whoever's keeping track of time when it's pulse check, I have them count down from 10 to zero. And at two seconds, I'm taking the probe off. It doesn't matter how close I am to getting the view. It doesn't matter if I kind of see something, but I'm not sure. I'm taking the probe off because remember the one thing that's been shown to uh, improve outcomes is adequate perfusion via chest compressions in patients that have CPR. Now, as far as the general way that I do this, I have the transducer kind of in one hand and I have a, a towel or a rag, something to clean the gel off in the other hand. So when we are about 30 seconds, 15 seconds, whenever it's announced that we're about to do the pulse check, I do one of two things. Uh, First thing is charge the the defibrillator, so that's ready to go. And the second thing is I put gel in my transducer, I have my rag ready. As soon as it's pulse check time, I am placing that transducer in, preferably at least to start with the subcostal window, and I'm pushing down pretty hard. I have, uh, you know, my fists, I'm like, right in that subcostal area, I have my elbow up, I'm pushing down and pushing up because I want to get to that view as fast as possible. Oftentimes, one of the limitations of obtaining a good subcostal window is patient discomfort because you have to remember, get that beam underneath the xiphoid process. If your patient's actively undergoing CPR, they are not aware of any pain. So don't feel bad about doing that, being a little more aggressive with your view because you need to get the view as quickly as possible. Once the person keeping track of time gets down to two seconds from 10, taking the probe off and I'm wiping the gel off because you don't want to have a slippery surface where you're doing chest compressions because obviously they're ineffective. And so you wipe that off and start chest compressions. I'm going to take a brief pause here just to let you know that all of our content is on the coreultrasound.com website. That is Ultrasound Podcast, 5 Minutes Sono, Ultrasound of the Week, Clip Bank, and we also have our courses page where we have the Core Ultrasound Fundamentals and Core Ultrasound Question Bank where you have 3,200 questions with feedback, including narrated videos explaining the question. Check it out and back to your video. Now, there are a couple of kind of modifications that you can do to improve your views in those pulse checks, and that is maybe starting off with that subcostal window, but then moving on to a parasternal or an apical four-chamber window. I actually often will use a apical four-chamber window even during chest compressions because you can actually do that. You're fairly far away from where the chest compressions are happening. And then understand that if you look at all patients, the most likely view or window of that heart 
to have great visualization is in that peritoneal long axis view. So if you're having issues with the subcostal, try a different view. This was based off of a study of 6,247 echo images at 29 different institutions. Here's the PubMed ID right here. And this same study also looked at some factors that increase the likelihood that you would have a high quality image. And that was, of course, the amount of experience. The more echoes a patient has done in the past, the better the views were, which makes sense because it's, it's reps, it's practice. And then if you were able to get a view quickly, much more likely for it to be a positive view, the longer amount of time it took you to get the view, the less likely you were to get a good view. And that's actually my experience. If it takes me 30 seconds to get a view, I'm not going to get a good view. Whereas if it takes me five seconds to get a view, it's a good view. Um, so just a couple things to kind of keep in mind there. Another thing that you can do to help out is to just simplify the question that you're answering during your pulse checks when you're using your ultrasound. Now there is a kind of protocol for this called the CASA protocol, which is the cardiac arrest sonographic assessment exam. And what they do basically is they do the ultrasound during the pulse check, they record a 10 second clip, they take the probe off, take the gel off, and then they review the image afterwards. And each pulse check, they're looking for a specific thing. The first one's tamp nod, second one's right heart strain, third one is cardiac activity. Um, we actually re reviewed this on the ultrasound gel podcast, and it was associated with more time savings. Although I will say that it's 19 seconds and then 15 seconds, it still is not right. It needs to be less than 10 seconds. If you can't get the view within eight seconds, you're not getting the view. Take your probe off. You don't want to delay the one thing that has been proven to be life-saving, and that is chest compressions. Another thing is to consider transesophageal echo. Shout out to Jimmy Fair for supplying these images. It can be used to guide compressions. Over on the right side, we're seeing phenomenal compressions, and we see these compressions after obtaining this window where we don't see great compression of the left side of the heart. Um, this is a, a, a transesophageal view, so everything's kind of reversed because you're coming at it from the back. Um, so this is actually left heart up here, right heart down here. We're seeing pretty good compression over here based off what we were able to see on that transesophageal echo. Here's another example. This is a four chamber view or technically a five chamber view. We're seeing not great compression, not great chest compressions of this LV. This is that same patient with really good CPR. If you weren't sure that it was good CPR, you can always look at the hint. This is good CPR. Also, what's uh, kind of interesting is if you look at the data, most people, when we uh, do chest compressions at the spot where we're taught to, like the intranipple line uh, on the sternum, it's actually overlying the LVOT. So essentially, like if you do compressions there, you're like blocking outflow uh, frequently because the LVOT is there. Um, so you can actually use that to show here, this is a Lucas device. That's why it looks so like mechanical. And you can see here, there's actually compression pressing the outflow track. This is the left atrium. This is the left ventricle. This is the aortic valve right there. Um, and you would move your compressions over to that left side to get a little bit more onto that apex. And of course you can identify pathology this way. This is a transesophageal view uh, It's a long axis view. This is the left ventricle, right hearts down here. And this is the atrium. And we're seeing like two valves, right? This is the aortic valve and this is a proximal aortic dissection. Um, here's that regurg from that causing that hemodynamic compromise. Again, thank you to uh, Jimmy Fair and uh, everybody out at the University of Utah because uh, these clips were supplied by them. And lastly, we can look at non-cardiac POCUS actually to help guide our management we can look at things outside of the heart during chest compressions to help guide our management. For instance, during chest compressions, you can look to see if there's a significant hemothorax, which we're seeing here during compressions, and you can actually look for that pneumothorax during compressions. Look out laterally, make sure that you're angling the beam instead of straight like this, angle it this way so that you're perpendicular to the pleura and you get a good view of that pleura. If you see beelines, that means that the 
visceral pleura, which is where B lines are generated from, is attached to the parietal pleura. So even though it's hard to see if this is good lung sliding or not, I'm seeing a lot of B lines. And if I can see B lines, it means that there's no air between the visceral and the parietal pleura, unlikely to have a pneumothorax. Sure, you might miss a small one anteriorly where the chest compressions are happening, but a small anterior pneumothorax is unlikely to be the cause of your patient coding. So really, if you look anywhere in either, both hemithoraces, you're going to be able to rule out a clinically significant pneumothorax and hemothorax. Now, lastly, let's talk about the pulse check outside of looking at the heart itself. There is some data to help us out here. These are two studies that show that you can identify a pulse with your femoral Doppler. It's just using your regular ultrasound, uh, the linear transducer, but you're using the Doppler, the pulse wave Doppler to look for those spikes. You can identify it significantly faster than with palpation. Now these studies, 137 patients, 57 patients, they are the PubMed IDs if you wanna know more. This is good, but what I really wanna know is can I use that to change what I do? Meaning, can I stop compressions if I don't feel a pulse, but I see a pulse or motion of that femoral artery with that linear transducer? We have one study that seems to imply that you might be able to. Now, of course, we need more data. This is a single place. This is 54 patients with 213 pulse checks. And this is exactly the way that I would want a study to be done. I was so happy when this came back, back in 2022. Now, their intervention here was Doppler ultrasound versus palpation for pulse checks. And all of them had an art line, which that's an amazing gold standard. So they found that with any pulse, ultrasound was more accurate. So we have 54% accurate with palpation versus 95% with that ultrasound. And honestly, like much more importantly, it actually gave us a number. So ultrasound was 91% accurate to determine if that patient had a systolic blood pressure greater than 60. It was 95% specific which is amazing. What they looked for is they looked for a maximum velocity of the femoral Doppler using pulse wave Doppler. This is a perfect waveform. This is like textbook waveform. You put the measurement up top at the, the highest point of the peak, and you're going to get a velocity. If it was greater than 20 centimeters per second, that is the cutoff on ultrasound that it correlated with. Here's a patient that I had that was peri-arrest. It's not a great image. And over here, we're, I have it angled. I have the blood flow actually moving away from the transducer. Um, it was actually going this way. And you can see here that I'm seeing a end isolic velocity, which is essentially a peak velocity. It just matters where the flow is. And as far as the peak systolic versus the end, end diastolic, this is all kind of just like set up with how I did it on the machine. So this is essentially peak systolic velocity. Um, and we're seeing here a number of uh, 20 centimeters per second, which is that cutoff. So this is stuff that's useful. I will give a caveat, and that is that this is one study. It does show that it's helpful, but I definitely would recommend using standard of care, talking with the leaders in your community and in your institution, and not using this necessarily in isolation. Use this along with all the other tools that you have at your disposal. So to recap everything that we talked about, we talked about identifying reversible causes, we talked about how we can use it during pulse checks, and we talked about procedural ultrasound. This is my contact information here. If you want to listen to the first part, check out that podcast or YouTube video on it. If you have any questions, reach out to me, any comments, anecdotes, interesting cases. I hope to hear from you soon and happy scanning.